Israel. I love Israel. I love the people. Totally so, uh, it's indescribable. It feels like home. It just feels like home. Welcome to Jerusalem. It was, just took my breath away. Yeah. It just shows the, the fingerprint of God everywhere. To realize how special the city and the people were to the Lord. It's God's chosen land and Jesus walked on it. I think there's a restoration as Pastor Miles talked about. How God is really gathering the Jews in. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we've been grafted in, and, and uh, now this is, this is our city also. Shalom, and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. And we have a great new series for you today, The Journey of Restoration. You know, when we bring people to Israel, it's always a life-changing experience. Absolutely. But not everyone can come to Israel. And so we have decided to bring Israel to you. A dream come true, Israel comes to you. And so we're going to take you from Dan to Beersheba, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan Valley, and you're going to get an insider's view of the wonderful things that we experience when we're hosting pilgrims in the land. You know, Israel is such a place where you will feel the presence of God like yeah. no other. It's a place that God promised that he would put his name forever. It is the center of the world. It's where he sent his son to die as a ransom to redeem mankind back. There's no place like it. There's nothing like Israel. In fact, uh, we begin our tour in Netanya. You and I go there a little bit right, ahead of time. Right, in Netanya. Yes. Yeah. And it's on the Mediterranean coast. You and I go a day ahead so we can prepare, we can pray. And you're always, always bringing Psalm 91 with us when Absolutely. we go. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. under the shadow of the wings of the Lord. And in a moment, You'll see what that means in this particular program as we are literally going to be speaking to you from under the shadow of the wings in Netanya. So let's go on location and begin our journey of restoration. We're here in Netanya, it's beautiful. The Mediterranean's before us, and behind us is a monument to Israel. You know, wherever you go in Israel, you will see something of the past and something of the present. And it's the Israeli people remembering from which they've come, from remembering the Holocaust, and now to the hope yes. of them being here in the land. Yeah. And Miles, two years ago, we walked past these wings, right. and we were just taken back by God's sign to us all throughout Israel. There signs yes. and these wings to me yep. reflect Psalm 91. Our pilgrims are coming to this very spot because they want to see he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91 speaks about no matter what the world has planned for Israel, God has other plans for Israel, for the Jewish people, and for those of us who are knit to Israel, grafted in by faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. In fact, the end of that psalm has the very word Yeshua T, the very name Yeshua, salvation, is in that psalm. And it's such a beautiful story because it reminds us of the story of Ruth where Boaz took his wings, took his talit, and spread it over Ruth. And just as I'm doing this with Catherine, so it is that the Lord is spreading his wings over Israel, and the promises to her are yes and amen. The Lord's presence is felt in his land the very moment you step off the plane. Your inner spirit bears witness to the fact that you've made it home. I say, welcome home. <laughs> welcome. Welcome home. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where you live, but this is nice home. Nice to have yes. you with yes. us. Yeah. Come on in. Wow. Hi. Are you with nice us? To nice you. to meet right. you. Oh, what's your name? I've seen a lot of the newsletters. Richard. Oh, Good. wonderful. So We're so glad you're here in Israel. First time, I know I think. it's real. Is this your yeah. first time? It is. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Well, wonderful. You're going to have a trip of a lifetime. <laughs> I'd like to say, welcome home. You'll see why in a few days. Hey. Wonderful. Nice Welcome to Welcome home, everybody. Us. Hi. Good to nice see you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> After a good night's rest, our group boards the bus and we're on our way to Caesarea. Caesarea Maritima was built by Herod the Great, the same king who built Israel's holiest of all structures, the temple. Herod built an immense harbor here that accommodated 300 ships at a time. The theater seats 3,500 people with a magnificent view of the Mediterranean Sea. We started our day in the theater as our guide Yuval Shemesh tells us about the biblical significance of this site. And we know that it was here in Caesarea that Paul gave his testimony, right? 
He was kept here in prison for two years, if you all remember that story in the book of Acts. And it was here in Caesarea that he have shared his testimony, uh, telling about the, uh, what had happened to him on the road to Damascus, the event that changed his life, and of course the life of many others later on. And we strongly believe that when Paul gave his testimony, it was right here in the theater. In the Bible it is written that just before he gave his testimony, uh, King Agrippa from Galilee, King Agrippa came to visit uh, Festus, the governor of the city, and he came here with his wife Bernice. Remember that story? And, and knowing that Paul is about to share his testimony, they, they, they've told uh, the governor that they would like to hear this man as well. And they were told, tomorrow you will hear him. And it's written in the Bible that the following day they came, the next day they came with a great pomp, big crowd. And they've entered the auditorium. That's what it says. But if we we'll check it out in the Greek Bible, which was written, yeah, first in the Greek language, the Bible was written in Greek, it is, it is written that they came all to the acousticon. And what it means, acousticon, a place of hearing, a theater, okay? The theater, they came to the acousticon, they came to the theater. So we can visualize it. When Paul was brought in and he was in chains, right? He, he had to stand in the, in, in the middle of what is known as the orchestra, perhaps on, on the stage. And then you can imagine Festo Sagriba Berenice sitting here in this box seat with a big crowd and then listening to Paul, okay? This is the place, ladies and gentlemen, where, where Paul gave his testimony right here. What you're doing is prophetic. By coming to the land, you're fulfilling the, the promises of God that this land would be restored, that the people of Israel would be restored, and that God would bring the nations together, bring the nations into the commonwealth of Israel. Now, I have a debt to you as well. Because Paul stood here, and because Cornelius opened his heart to the Lord, and because the Holy Spirit came and poured out his life on Cornelius, the gospel went forth from here to all the nations, to the West and around the world, and is coming back to my Jewish people. So here we are at the end of the age, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, and God is bringing the word back, and the, the Jewish people are being made alive by the Spirit of God. For the first time since the first century, there's a move of the Spirit here in Israel that is so strong that the word of the Lord is being sent out again from Jerusalem, from Israel, to the nations once again. And if you think about it, this is a place where kingdoms are in conflict. There's the Spirit of Rome, there's the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of man, all vying for attention. And isn't that something like what we experience in the church today? Really, the, this is a place where entertainment, where passivity, and where even vile entertainment took place. And we are subject to those same forces today. God is trying to get us to think Hebrew thoughts. It's been said that there are three spirits at work in the world, the, the three mindsets that are at work in the world, the barbarian spirit, the Greek mindset, and the Hebraic mindset. The barbarian says, which God? What does it matter? God, I don't know God. And they wind up having a very cruel and intimidating life that comes from that mindset. So we see that at work in the world today in cer certain political systems and certain religious systems. There's the Greek mindset. The Greeks say, which God should I serve? And the Jewish mindset, the Hebrew mindset, we know who God is and we say, what do you want from me? Because we know who he is. And the question is, how should we serve him? What do we do? And so you're here because you've settled who he is. And your desire is to serve Him and to know Him and to walk with Him. And so by walking this land and by being here in this place, we're knitting our hearts together with the heart of Paul. We're saying once again the gospel is going forth and we're committing in a fresh way to let the Hebraic mindset, the mindset of the Bible, infuse our lives and go forth through our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. A short distance from the theater is a wonderful lookout of the surrounding area. It's like walking back in time through the pages of the Bible. And they've uncovered, here to your left, you can see Herod's palace, okay? Straight ahead, the hippodrome that was used for chariot races. And if you all have watched the old movie, Hollywood movie, Ben-Hur, chose the hippodrome, such a hippodrome. Far away, over the wall, 
was the location of the harbor. Okay, remember the big harbor? It was able to hold 100 Roman ships back then. And look at the palace, it was one of his uh, summer palaces for Herod the Great. Uh, the lower level goes back to Herod's time. The top level was added later. It was just a nice garden. But notice the location nearby the water, beautiful palace. Um, of course, he knew exactly what uh, to do. How do you say it uh, at home? Location, location, location. Okay. There you go. Um, and we are going to, to visit here and to see uh, a stone tablet, uh, which is a replica, but it is a very important, I think, uh, the most, uh, I think, important archaeological discovery that was made here at Caesarea. It is the stone tablet you're about to see depicting the name of Pontius Pilate, the governor. Okay, this stone tablet was discovered in the theater as one of the steps. Uh, in the th so we think uh, it was reused. It was taken away from a different structure and then was reused to renovate uh, the theater at some point. Uh, but uh, on the name of Pontius Pilate is on that stone. The first time ever that the name of Pontius Pilate was discovered in archaeological sites. So beside the Bible and the historians that are describing him, here we have like archaeological evidence okay, for, for him. For insightful perspectives on Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. At levitt.com you can read the newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit our online store. Stay current with us on social media via Facebook and Twitter. Come with us on a tour of Israel or Petra, or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. Our resource for this program is Discovering Our Jewish Roots, a one-of-a-kind study with nine CDs and workbook that begins with a survey of Old Testament messianic prophecies. This simple and direct lesson plan covers a vast range of topics, packaged in a handsome custom album with the matching 21-page study booklet. Don't miss your opportunity to enhance your understanding of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. I really recommend that Discovering Our Jewish Roots CD set. It's a great introduction to many of the topics we cover on this program. Many questions that you have will be answered through that CD set. I also want to recommend our newsletter to you, The Levitt Letter. It's free to you every month. It's not only a newsletter about what we're doing here at the ministry, but really will give you an insider's view of what's going on in Israel, where we are in the prophetic timetable, mm -hmm. and really how to interpret the news because as you know, we don't always hear the truth through the mainstream news media. So those are really good resources for you. We're going to be going to Megiddo. We're going to travel northeast from the coast to Megiddo. We're going to see one of the oldest tells, or archaeological dig, one of the oldest ones in the world. Right. There are layers, generations of history at Megiddo. It's a place where the end of the battles will be won. Exactly so. In fact, Napoleon himself, Napoleon said, this is a great place for a battle. Well, however, it's going to be where kingdoms in conflict are going to find their resolution. Uh, Armageddon is a poor translation of Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. We're going to see that explained by our messianic guide, Yuval Shemesh. You know, he came to faith over the course of his career as a tour guide. He's been tour guiding for uh, more than 20 years. And in that process, right. by going through the Bible and walking through the Bible, he became a believer. And Megiddo is a significant place. It's got incredible history. It's where the righteous King Josiah was killed. It has history being so close to Nazareth, a place mm -hmm. that Yeshua could look and see the future, which he knew would be taking place there. So without any further ado, let's go to Megiddo in Israel. So all the armies who came against the nation of, of Israel back in the, in, in, uh, all through, uh, through history, they always came right through here, through the valley, because it's a mountain pass. So as we speak about the final war, the final battle, the only way you can bring in to the land mighty army, it will be through the valley, okay? To follow from the northeast, the, the Jordan Valley first, and then the Jezreel Valley on your way to the coastal plain. And indeed, for centuries, the valley you are facing was a battle zone. And great, great wars, battles took place right here. And again, one more yet to come, the final war, the final battle. 
As you look across the valley, you'll see a big city up there on the mountains. And ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at Nazareth, the town of Nazareth, the big city up on top of the hills. Okay, when, when Christ was born, when Yeshua was, was born in this country, he was born in Bethlehem, but he was brought up in Nazareth, the town up there, which was much smaller. Today it's a very large city, but back then we we're talking about a small village with maybe 20 families. Okay, but Yeshua had been brought up up there on the other side on the mountains. And you can find it very symbolic, very powerful thought. You know, this side of the valley in a way represents evil. We have talked about the, uh, the worship of Baal on the high places, Mount Carmel, or in, here at Megiddo. But as you look just the opposite direction, you're looking at the place where our Savior had been brought up. And one day they are going to meet good and evil right here in the middle of the valley. You know, Israel is a land where the past is important, the present and the future. Megiddo is certainly one of those sites where mm -hmm. we see the history of Israel and what's coming in the future. Now we're going to go up to Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is a significant historical site mm -hmm. and a great place where God is doing some awesome things today. Well, as we know in the Bible, Mount Carmel is where Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal. Yes. Yes, and that confrontation is still going on in the heavenlies mm -hmm. as the Carmel Assembly on top of Mount Carmel has set their sights on breakthrough worship and the preaching of the One New Man message, mm -hmm. which totally impacted our lives right. uh, 10 years ago or more. And the One New Man message from Ephesians 2 is about the breaking down of the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, especially as we see in their assembly, Jews and Arabs worshiping God together. So. Let's go to Mount Carmel and see what God is doing today and what he set his sights on for the future. God has brought you to Israel to just not go on a tour, see the sights, get some exposure, but to really get the heart of God for what he's doing in this land right now. And it's not something that you can just teach. I mean, you can teach it, but to see it, to feel it, to smell it, to hold it, to connect with us as the body. I believe the Lord has chosen Miles and Catherine to really make that bridge happen in a very deep way because your lives were so impacted by the understanding that God's given. And so the fact that they have gone out in a sense to be ambassadors, it's not just about Israel. It is about understanding who Israel is in God's heart and in God's plan but it's understanding that there is a body right now. Just to give you a little bit of history about who we are, as I said, Peter and I obeyed a call that we received way back when we first became believers. We were hippies, <gasps> believe it or not, hippies in that we were people who were seeking yeah. a radically different lifestyle and a radically different way of, of society back in the late 60s and early 70s. And by the grace of God, he brought us to a place in New Mexico. Anybody from New Mexico know I heard Arizona? Close, but not exactly. But uh, he brought us to a place there called Shalom. And in this coffee house ministry, we were introduced to another group of people that we didn't know who were really pioneer hippies. One of them was a man named Andrew. Andrew Shishkoff, who later became Eitan, our very dear, beloved friend of Miles and Catherine as well. And he gave his story that night. And it was so compelling to me because it was really my story. They had lost a friend, our friend had been killed. All of this in our hippie grasping led to nothing, led to just more desperation. And I really thought I could never go home again. I just thought I'm gonna be out in this desert to die. You know, like Moses said, you call me out here to die. I didn't know where and what. But when I got introduced to the Messiah of Israel, and it was right after the 1973 war, and actually the day the war broke out, which was in, in October 73, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the Jewish year. And even though I was a hippie, living my life way out in the middle of, as I said, nowhere in the desert, the high mountains of... Uh, 
New Mexico, I went to synagogue. Mm. And on that day, I had hitchhiked there. You know, you're not supposed to walk. But any, I mean, drive, but I, I didn't, it was too far to walk. And I went in there, and on that day, somebody came running into the synagogue, and he said, they've just bombed us, us. You know, Jews from anywhere in the world, that us becomes one, because what happens in Israel affects every Jew, if they identify as a Jew. And I knew something huge was happening. And it was part of a prophetic fulfillment that we, of course, are still seeing happening. But even I, in my different state of mind, knew that this was a significant event. So when just a few weeks later, as I heard Andrew Eitan tell his story, and they were Jews, they were Jewish hippies who found their Messiah, to the shock of all of us, it was this foreign God this Jesus who lived in the Catholic Church. Now, I don't say that to offend any Catholics, but I'm telling you, as a New York Jew, growing up in a very strongly culturally Jewish home, Jesus, and we prefer to call him by his Hebrew name, Yeshua, which I hope you've already heard, or if you haven't, means salvation. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. And so when I heard that he's the one who came 2,000 years ago for his own. And the scripture said, but his own knew him not. And that is us. We didn't know him because he's been so painted over by thousands of years of cultural change, of him becoming something that he wasn't. He was a, well, he's the son of God who came for his own people. And he died on the holiday of Passover when we all knew that the lamb was slaughtered and the blood put on the door so he so the angel of death really the death would would go over the jewish homes and that's what he did but we didn't know this we only knew him as a statue so foreign from the mentality of jews so my life changed because i had a revelation that night i said no 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 i don't want to hear about it but my heart just broke and all the sin and all the darkness and all the filth that i wanted to be cleansed on that Yom Kippur a few weeks earlier, got cleansed that night. Yeah. And I never forgot it. And I stand before you in tears because you should never forget, never, that you were saved by grace. To see this building on top of Mount Carmel is to witness a modern day miracle. Adjacent to the sanctuary are facilities to feed, clothe, and train the needy so that they might be better equipped to be productive members of their community. We had 500 volunteers from 40 nations come and build this. And this was the first freestanding Messianic congregation built probably in 2,000 years. And so for that, the significance of it is that God chose the very, very top of Mount Carmel. This is the altar of the Lord. And every week, you will see people, as we preach the word of God, come forward and give their lives because it's an altar. And what's the altar? It's the meeting place of God and man. We're not looking for a Christian church. We don't need any more, especially not in Israel with our history of anti-Semitism that people equate with the church. Why? Because people bearing crosses crucified thousands and killed thousands of people during the Crusades. And people with crosses sent people off to Auschwitz and to concentration camps. We know they were not true Christians, but this is the concept of the cross. So you don't see a cross here. You see here the 12 stones. And what did the 12 stones stand for? The 12 tribes. But we, remember I mentioned before, believe strongly in the one new man, Jew, and Arab. So one of our stones is actually from a city that's now in the West Bank called Janine. It was carried here, wow. and it's one of our stones. Because we are to embrace the one new man because Yeshua broke down the wall of partition. So we have the 12 stones, count them, they're hidden, some of them. And we believe strongly in an open heaven. And the power and the fire will fall. So we have our worship team here. We have Jews and Arabs together and a couple of Germans thrown in there and a few other people in our worship team. We have dance, we have rejoicing. 
and we have warfare because you all know we're in the battle no matter where you are but we happen to be right in the battle we're 25 kilometers or miles south of the border I always forget but those rockets can come and uh, we just really appreciate who you are for standing with us and for coming at this time what a blessing it was to hear Rita's testimony of God's provision in the land and then a double portion another blessing Pam Singer ministered in song I think right here at Mount Carmel is the highlight of the day. Yeah, yes. the blessing was just the presence of the Lord was amazing. Yes. Still is. <laughs> Still is. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. There's nothing like listening and hearing and feeling it from someone that's here doing it. And uh, this truly put everything in perspective. Anytime you go anywhere to hear about it, the history, et cetera, is, is awesome. Um, but when you feel it, it's just indescribable. And that's what this was. Yeah. When I got off the airport, you know, at the airport, and they said, welcome home, I'm going, oh my gosh, I never looked at it like that, but I'm home. I think you can see from Lynn's testimony how much that she loves the land, the land of God's covenant, and we love bringing it to you. We love sharing God's heart for Israel, but we can't continue with these programs without your support. So we just want to put that out there to you and remind you that without your gifts of funds, we won't be able to continue. So thank you for the gifts of funds and thanks for standing with us as we stand with Israel. Exactly so. It's a joy to bring these programs to you and we look forward to bringing you more. You know, we've only just begun this journey of restoration. So stay with us and until we see you again, remember, Shalom, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our resource for this program is Discovering Our Jewish Roots, a one-of-a-kind study with nine CDs and workbook that begins with a survey of Old Testament messianic prophecies. This simple and direct lesson plan covers a vast range of topics, packaged in a handsome custom album with the matching 21-page study booklet. Don't miss your opportunity to enhance your understanding of the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. Our monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is free and full of insightful articles and news commentary from a messianic perspective. Visit levitt.com to find our newsletter, along with current and past programs, our television schedule, and much more. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries help these organizations bless Israel. Please remember, Zola Levitt Ministries depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.